Yo. What's up? Yo, yo, yo. Um, good morning. Hope everybody's weekend's going well. It's good to see you guys. It's Sunday, baby. Uh, we'll get our news in. And, uh, I don't know. I guess some Gwent. I don't know, man. I'm feeling a bit stagnant on, uh, the gaming stuff right now. I need, I need something. I need something. I don't know what I want to play. But we'll probably just do some Gwent today. Um, maybe a little bit of Fall Guys. And we'll figure it out. I need, I need to find something, though. But it's good to see you guys, as always. Let's go ahead and do what we do. Let's do what we do. Let's get this uh, gaming news segment going. Cool, cool, cool. Out. Get it. Yeah, I'm not diving into the Netflix thing. We've talked a lot about that, so. We'll take a quick peek at this. Uh, an entire uh, gaming console built into a mini fridge. Sick. I think the only thing you really got to worry about there is condensation potentially. But there are ways to uh, avoid that. Circumvent that. So that's pretty cool. Uh, Game Pass versus the new PS Plus. Here we go, guys. This is kind of something that we've talked about, right? Within the, uh, the channel and the community. As, uh, you know, the, the new PlayStation subscription service was coming out. And obviously, the, the point of it was to be a big competitor to Game Pass, right? Xbox's big golden, golden goose, as it were, right now. Game Pass. Um, you know, PlayStation just did, did not have anything that was really on the same level. They had PS Plus, but it wasn't the sub same subscription service it is now. With it rolling out at the end of May, beginning of June, uh, we'd kind of been waiting to see a good kind of early comparison regarding the two subscription services. And it looks like Kotaku has uh, come up with that for us. So let's take a look. Clever KBRD is a breakout where you bounce balls. What? Let's see what this is. New Age Pong. Is that what we're talking about here? I'm not going to dive into this, but uh, 5G networking, uh, mobile networking, is is actually bringing uh, streaming gaming to mobile devices in a much more prevalent way. Um, we're seeing like AAA games being brought to devices and, and um, mobile devices. Providers like like AT and T and T Mobile and Verizon and things like that they're 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 rolling out these platforms where people are able to access AAA type titles and um, able to play them just through streaming. Five um, G is a big contributor to that that capability. 
So we've we've taken a bit of a dive into it previously. So I'm not I'm not going to pull up this article this morning. Just know that that's going to be continue to be escalated as we move forward. As 5G becomes more prevalent of a mobile network, more people are uh, utilizing 5G devices, and as gaming becomes more entrenched in what we do, right? Um, gamer, what's up, buddy? How was work yesterday, man? RDR actor addresses remake rumors. Very busy. Man, I'm sorry, dude. Hopefully it at least made the day go fast, man. Oh, PlayStation survey asks players what types of NFTs they want. I don't even like to see that. I mean, at least they're pinging the community first, but God. Uh, GTA Online player discovers secret outfit perks. See what that that's about. Go ahead and pivot. Sundays tend to be a bit more bleak for us for news but we'll get it we'll get an amount in here Call of Duty case thrown out as the plaintiff had never played the game hmm Yeah, Uncharted, I saw that. Uncharted is actually uh, on Netflix right now, the movie. I'll probably take a watch. It's supposed to be a pretty good flick. Madden NFL 23 devs want to stop money plays forever. Sony buying Square Enix would be the best thing for both companies. I think Sony buying Square Enix would be the best thing for fans of uh, Square Enix's titles moving forward. Absolutely. The direction I see Square Enix heading, I am not happy. I am not looking forward to what is to come from Square Enix right now with the direction they're headed. Uh, it, it is really, really concerning to me as a lover of video games, man. Yes. Oh, right on. Right on, gamer. Is it uh, just... Do you have any idea? I haven't played Off Path Traveler. I have heard good things about it. Do you know if the mobile title is just built in the same world and a completely different kind of style of game? Or is it the game more 
just uh, platformed over to mobile devices. Do you have any idea? It has a different name, so I'm guessing, or it's got a, an extended name, so I'm guessing it's been developed as a, a uh, standalone game more for within the world of Octopath. That's what I'm guessing. But I hadn't heard of the mobile title. I can pull it up. I can pull it up. I just didn't know if you knew. Okay. Um, Marvel versus Capcom 2 Freed at last. All right, let's see. Yeah, this was about the uh, Joy-Con controllers are now able to be used on Steam, which is really cool. Deus Ex developer may not release new entry for a very long time. Okay. Just saying, I'll pull it up, buddy. We'll take a look. Thanks, man. I don't even know what to think about this. Skull Girls confirmed. What is this? What kind of title is this? Skull Girls confirm as playable characters of the next years. What? Dude, that is a terrible title. Uh, we'll read this. It, apparently, it's the the next characters coming to their their fighting game. But that dude, what a terrible title! Ghost Recon Wildland servers are having major problems. Uh, Ubisoft, am I right? Diablo Four test build leaks are already surfacing online. Let's stay with that. Let me pull up this. Uh... Reddit. Let's see. Uh, we look at a lot of GameSpot stuff. Is this a, an actual review? And now, hold on. There's Kotaku. They're saying the uh, the Champions of the Continent is better than the Switch original. All right, we'll read this one real quick. I like Kotaku a lot. I usually can put some pretty good. I feel like I can put uh, <laughs> to Bo. What's up, buddy? I usually feel like I can put some pretty good stock into what Kotaku throws into some articles for us. So we'll go with Kotaku there. And we'll take a look at it, okay, gamer? Sound good, buddy? We'll end uh, we'll end the second. You got do you got you have to work today, dude? You gotta work today? Tabo, what's up, buddy? How are you, man? That looks like a good amount of articles. 
Uh, not a bleak Sunday by any means. <laughs> Good day to you. Good sirs, ladies, helicopters, wicks. Cool, cool. Yeah, man. We'll uh, we'll read about it. Cool. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, man. Uh, Ghost Recon Wildlands servers are having major problems, guys. Open world co-op game Ghost Recon Wildlands is experiencing major server problems, rendering its online features unavailable for many. Um, Ghost Recon Wildlands launched in 2017 to a somewhat mi mixed reaction. The game has earned praise for its online co-op features. Even though the game is five years old at this point, new... Excuse me, new players are discovering Ghost Recon Wildlands for the first time thanks to its addition to the Xbox Game Pass lineup. Unfortunately, new and longtime players alike are currently unable to enjoy Ghost Recon Wildlands online co-op. Ghost Recon Wildlands has been suffering from online connectivity issues for days now. Days. I mean, in the gaming world, that might as well be years. With no end in sight, some players have been able to start online co-op sessions, but it seems many others have been uh, completely unable to play the game in co-op. Ubisoft first acknowledged the problems with Ghost Recon Wildlands online co-op on August 4th, but it was unable to provide a timetable for when the problems would be fixed. Oh, Tabo, I'm sorry, buddy, but I mean, hey, dude, all you gotta do, just turn on the stream, chill back, dude, relax, go ahead and just take a nap, man. While you listen to my nice, calming voice. You know what I mean? We'll call it News Naps with OA. <laughs> oh, dude. Uh, Ghost Recon Wildland server still, uh, issues are still plaguing the game at the time of this writing. A fan recently took to Twitter to ask Ubisoft for an update on the Ghost Recon Wildland server issues, but Ubisoft responded by saying it does not have an estimate for when the problem will be fixed. Upset Ghost Recon fans and uh, Game Pass subscribers have taken to social media to vent their frustrations. <laughs> yeah, there you go, dude. Yeah, that's real comfortable right there, buddy. Just, just let it let loose, dude. Yep. Uh, Ghost Recon Wildlands was at the forefront of the new Xbox Game Pass games for August, serving as the latest uh, latest Ubisoft published title to be added to Microsoft's gaming subscription service. It was preceded by some other Ubisoft heavy hitters like Assassin's Creed Origins and Watch Dogs 2. Uh, so am I, dude. It's good. It's good. It's good. That's not a bad thing. There are plans to bring, uh, yeah, there are plans to bring even more Ubisoft games to Xbox Game Pass in the future. Hopefully future Xbox, uh, Ubisoft Xbox Game Pass games are able to avoid the online connectivity issues uh, Wildlands is experiencing. Unclear what could be causing uh, the online connectivity problems for Wildlands. Once Ubisoft pinpoints the problem and resolves it, it's unlikely that it will reveal the issue. This is standard practice for video game companies and tech companies in general whenever there are service outages or technical problems of this nature. For example, whenever Xbox Live goes down or PlayStation Network is inaccessible, the company simply announce when the services have been restored and very rarely, if ever, provide any kind of explanation as to what caused the problems. Um, Ghost Recon fans can try playing Ghost Recon Breakpoint while they wait for Wildlands servers to be restored. Though it should be noted that Breakpoint reviews were significantly more negative than Wildlands. Yeah, guys, I mean, days, days for servers to be down. That, that's literally an eternity in, in the gaming world, you know, so. And here we go, man. This is just more news about Ubisoft in a negative light. Which... I don't know what's going on in that studio. Uh, server issues. Uh, development issues to the extent of games consistently being delayed for years and years and years. Uh, or just many games being outright uh, scratched and done, done away with, you know. It really, it seems like this studio is getting to a point where uh, they have a very, very, very tough time handling anything outside of their mainstream titles like Assassin's Creed and Far Cry. It's really, uh, I don't know what's going on there with Ubisoft, man, but it does not look good. You know, we just keep seeing more more bad stuff coming out of Ubisoft. Uh, Diablo 4 test build leaks already surfacing online. Diablo 4 is said to be in a stage of development where it's being tested by friends and family of Blizzard employees, which comes as good news. Given it means that one step, that's one step closer to a wider beta test. 
However, that test appears to have been accompanied by the somewhat expected trickling of Diablo 4 leaks that have started surfacing online recently. The leaks don't always stay uh, up for long and don't reveal a great deal themselves, but if they're already starting to come out, it's likely we'll only see more of them in the future. As leaks typically are, when it comes to an upcoming game, the leaks from whatever Diablo 4 test is going on now have been spotted here and there throughout the game subreddit. You can usually bet you'll find some of that kind of stuff on Reddit. The Trenches. Uh, one such post pulls from the outlet Judge Hype, which coincidentally appears to have pulled them first from screenshots shared on Reddit. The round and round nature of these leaks perhaps uh, has something to do with the fact that posts showcasing leaks and spoilers are being deleted from Reddit too. But as evidenced by these leaks persisting through different posts, they're here to stay now that they're online. Though any leak is worth viewing for those fond of those early looks at games, this leak doesn't really showcase much. This one in particular shows off the character creation screen, as well as the difficulty options available at the start of the game. The leaks also have the private test build number plastered all over them, presumably identifying whoever the player is. So even though Blizzard hasn't officially confirmed a friends and family test or anything like that at this time, it's evident some sort of test is certainly going on at this time. Uh, leaks like these have prompted the moderators of the subreddit to address the situation in a post that essentially explained posting pre-release info is ill-advised but not punishable so long as the leaks don't consist of actual files or downloads. Uh, that means that leaks won't be scrubbed for the sake of no spoiler purity in a subreddit. So if you're keen on seeing leaks, you'll likely find them there in the future. Yeah, no release date yet for Diablo 4, but... A lot of people are looking forward to whenever they're going to be able to be able to, whenever they're going to be able to jump in and start uh, testing the game out, do betas and stuff like that. <sighs> I'm so torn. I'm so torn. I just I won't play a Blizzard game right now. I just won't do it. And Diablo is such a huge part of who I am as a gamer, you know, in my my past and in my history, and so. That's a really tough thing for me. Uh, gamer built an entire gaming console into the mini fridge. Microsoft released mini fridges for the Xbox last year. Many people said they weren't the best sellers of the devices themselves. They praised their performance as only as suitable for keeping drinks hot, but not for cooling them. One of the uh, one of the buyer of the Xbox Series X mini fridge, a TikTok user uh, nicknamed Abitrickle. The inventor uh, decided to perform an experiment. He used a mini fridge case as a PC. The blogger built a uh, 3090. I think built it with a 3090 video card and a 750 watt power supply inside the refrigerator itself uh, after removing most of the other elements inside the fridge. Uh, Some of the cooling elements were also required to be tossed out by the PC. Uh, here you can see the kind of computer he was using for the components in the mini fridge. Um, this article is not great. Here, where? I don't even know. Okay. So somebody took a uh, Xbox fridge, Series X fridge, and turned it into a PC. Cool. Uh, they did not link stuff. They did not put images embedded into the uh, site. So great job, guys. Fantastic. Game Pass versus the new PS Plus, the comparison we had to make. Uh, Sony's reimagined games on demand services share a lot in common with Microsoft. I mean, are we surprised at that fact? I don't think so. I mean... That's just to be expected. Whenever, uh, I, I don't think there's anybody out there that went, PlayStation's coming out with a subscription service. It, I'm expecting it to be completely different than Game Pass. No. I think everybody, knowing that PlayStation was coming out with a subscription service to compete with Game Pass, figured it was going to be pretty similar, right? Two months ago, Sony reimagined PS Plus, its longtime membership program for PlayStation owners. Now, on that note, this is what I think is very important for both of these subscription services moving forward. 
what can they do to set themselves apart from one another, right? I think that's that's the very, very critical thing that they both have to start looking at. And there's no doubt about this as well. When they come up with these kinds of ideas to set themselves apart from the other, um, the other will follow suit and copy that. But having the jump on that and being the one that comes up with that unique concept in the first place, uh, and even to the point of maybe being able to copyright it so that uh, the other cannot copy it, is a big deal. Yeah. So we'll see how that flows as time moves forward between both of these subscription services. Um, it looks a whole lot like Microsoft's Game Pass for roughly the same amount of money. Both offer access to a Netflix-style games-on-demand library. Uh, obviously, we had to stack the two services up against each other. Game Pass is available as a subscription for console, PC, or both. The two separate tiers cost $10 a month. Xbox Live Ultimate, which joins the two and provides access to the EA Play library, and Xbox Live Gold costs $15 a month. There's no way to pay for multiple months or a year up front at a tiered markdown. Now, Game Pass is actually currently rolling out a test in, what was it? Was it Brazil? I think it was Brazil and one other country right now where they are trying out a family plan for Game Pass. Where it's basically double this price, but you get five people get access to this service rather than just one. So, whereas it's $15 a month for one person, one account to have access, uh, they're rolling out this test right now for a family plan where it's $30 a month, but five accounts get access to the Game Pass, right? So, um, family plan being it could be a family or it could be a your family of friends. You know what I mean? Whoever wants to pitch in and, and get their accounts hooked up to this, uh, this family plan. And ultimately, across the board, that's going to be paying less than you would as a single account, right? PS Plus is also available for a subscription, but it gets very complicated very fast. There are two new tiers. The extra is a $15 a month or $100 for the year and offers free monthly games, online play, and a catalog of on-demand games, including some of Ubisoft's library. Premium is at $18 a month or $120 a year and adds access to classic games, game trials, and cloud streaming for most of the games in the library. That's a huge price difference, and while PS Plus Premium is more expensive month to month, it's actually almost 50% cheaper if you commit to the whole year. Streaming. Now, this is another thing where... Um, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong... And this will probably change in the future, but... I think right now, PlayStation subscription service is not available on PC, right? Whereas Game Pass has can be accessed for both console and PC, right? Now, uh, and I'm pretty sure of that let's let's just let's verify this before we 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 get too deep here. So apparently you can't access the games uh, Seems like it But I don't know how uh, intuitive it would be for a uh, PC user right now, 
in comparison to what Xbox has just inherently because Microsoft is Windows is Xbox, right? So, um, and they've been doing this for a while already as opposed to PlayStation probably needing to, you know, work on this a bit. I don't know. I haven't tested either one, but uh, it does appear like you can play PlayStation Plus on your PC. All right. All right. Cool. The more you know. Um, so we've talked about the, uh, the tears and everything, right? There. Obviously, there, there's a bit of a, uh, you know, you, you really need to take a hard look at the PlayStation side of things to determine which tier you're wanting to buy into. There's uh, three different tiers. There's a big difference between all of them, really, and, and just between price and content that you're, you're afforded, as opposed to Xbox, which is pretty cut and dry. Um, streaming. Game Pass allows for cloud streaming, provided you pay for the price of your ultimate tier. Uh, the streaming functionality is technically still in beta, but it is, for all intents and purposes, up and running. Microsoft recommends internet speeds of at least 10 uh, megabits per second for mobile devices and 20 megabits for consoles and PCs. Based on Kotaku's testing, it's fine. Despite cloud gaming's huge advancements recently, streaming still can't compete with downloaded games. The latency, however, minor is unignorable. So as such, cloud gaming is best used for puzzlers, chill RPGs, light platformers, and other games that don't demand split-second reflexes. Microsoft says more than 100 games are currently streamable via cloud gaming on Xbox Game Pass, but more games are added every few weeks. Right now, the Game Pass library uh, currently lists 381 games as capable of streaming. To unlock streaming on PS Plus, you need to buy the $18 a month tier. And even then, the streaming quality is nothing to write home about. At best, it's as good as Xbox Cloud Gaming. Sometimes it's worse. Roughly 320 games from the premium library can be streamed on console or PC. And a good chunk of those are PS3 games and classics rather than the full PlayStation 4 library. For example, Marvel's Avengers and Stray are available on console, but not in the streaming library. Most notably, you can't stream PS Plus games to your phone. For now, the service uh, relies on remote play, meaning you need a console to play on mobile and you must be the, on the same Wi-Fi network. A game library. Of course, a games on demand service is only good, as good as the one thing it's supposed to provide, games. Right now, the Xbox Game Pass library has about 475 games, but that tally comprises the library across both tiers, including 92 games currently part of EA Play. The main draw, of course, is that Microsoft puts its entire first-party portfolio on the platform. That also includes the major tentpoles like Halo Infinite and Forza Horizon 5, alongside forthcoming blockbusters like Starfield. Go <laughs> they, uh... <laughs> Pause for a second. Devake his rating with two viewers. Devake, uh, thank you, my friend. How are you? One second, guys. Thank you very much, everybody. If you're not familiar with uh, Devake, long time uh, supporter, friendo of our channel, and awesome, uh, awesome broadcaster, content creator. So uh, please do me a favor, check out that link and uh, show some of that, uh, show some of our community love, some of that outsider love and uh, throw some follows over there, please. Okay. Oh yeah. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Thank you very much again for the uh, raid, my friend. Thank you. Um, so some of the notable games, right? They, they include their first party games, uh, major tent poles like Halo Infinite and Forza Horizon 5 alongside forthcoming blockbusters like Starfield and Redfall, which become available the day they came out. Uh, Third-party games tend to tr uh, stick around for a year at most, though. Some like Rockstar's open-world hold-em-up simulator Red Dead Redemption 2 uh, become unavailable after a matter of months. It's unpredictable. 
The library also regularly circle, uh, cycles in third-party games and often serves as a launch, launch pad for indie games. Gems, excuse me. This year alone, the uh, Twee Zelda-like Tunic, which uh, our buddy Cash uh, played and loves, the snowboarding sim Shredders, and the puzzler dungeon crawler Loot River all launched. Yeah, uh, Loot River looks really cool. All launched on Game Pass. Um, developers have acknowledged to Kotaku that de debuting on Game Pass cuts into initial sales, but is ultimately worth it for the trade-off in publicity. Yeah. Uh-huh. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I... I was aware that she wasn't the only one. Unless you're talking about another. <laughs> uh, PS Plus Extra currently includes uh, around 430 PS4 and PS5 games, while Premium adds another 395 PS1, PS2, PS3, and PSP. While the classics are a nice bonus, the biggest draw by far are the PlayStation exclusives like Horizon Zero Dawn, God of War, Spider-Man, and Bloodborne. Unlike Microsoft, Sony has committed to not putting its newest release on the service day to day and date. And if Returnal arriving a year after release is any indication, it seems like a good bet that players will have to wait at least a year to 18 months before newer stuff appears. Uh, there are plenty of strong contenders in the third-party department, though. Games like FF7 Remake, Prey Control, Doom, and Tetris Effect are all present, as are indies like Celeste, Outer Wilds, Dead Cells, and Virginia. Uh, the library has plenty of diversity and was bolstered most recently from the same-day edition of Stray, which is already a 2022 Game of the Year contender. Uh, the Ubisoft com uh, component, led by Assassin's Creed Valhalla, is also a strong compliment. At the same time, Sony hasn't yet demonstrated it is or will be as aggressive as Microsoft is courting a steady stream of third-party day and date editions. There's also no PC-exclusive portion of the library. Oh! Oh, wow! Man! You guys are just everybody. Wow. All right. Cool. Well, there's another congrats in there then. Yeah. Cool. Be, be lots of babies. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Right on. Right on. Nice. All right. Babies. Cool, cool, cool. Um, yo, thanks again for the raid, my friend. It's good to see you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, going into this exercise, the, uh, so Ari from Kotaku states, going into this exercise, I totally imagined I'd paint a clear picture of Game Pass superiority. But these two services seem fundamentally... I mean, are, are you ready for that, Nevaeh? Are, are you ready for that title? Uh, these two services seem fundamentally identical uh, to me, right down to the UI. With Sony's new version of PS Plus marginally better in the few aspects that matter, the prices are mostly the same, but the option to pay for a year of PS Plus at a discount edges out Game Pass in that regard. Sure, Game Pass is big draws that it puts Microsoft's first-party games on the service at launch, but Microsoft barely has any first-party games out this year. Right now, that perk seems like little more than a marketing line. Um, and Ethan states, I also thought Game Pass would be the clear winner coming out of this, but now I'm conflicted as well. Not everyone can afford to pay for a full year up front, but it really changes the calculus in this matchup. Uh, there are some key differences as well, and while I don't think they make one a clear winner over the other, I do think it makes it easier to decide which one you want to pay for. Want immediate access to a meaty back catalog of some of the biggest and best games from the last generation? PS Plus wins. Want to stay current on some of the best new games coming out every month and play them at any time on your phone? Then it's Game Pass all the way. Well, there you go, guys. I mean, currently, I, dude, I didn't mean to do that. If you're, and I know, uh, uh, you know, our buddy Gamer has uh, really been uh, rando mode time. Let's go. What a great rando mode to start the day with. Squid 4, let's go. Tentacles!
Nice. All right, sorry. Um, no, I'm not ready, but I'm very happy for the girls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, me too. Me too, my friend. Yeah. Um, well, let, let uh, Annabelle know I said congrats. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just from me to your entire family, since we got so many... Uh, <laughs> So much going on there, man. There's so many babies coming in. I mean, you know, you guys will just be in uh, our thoughts and everything for everybody to just stay healthy and, and uh, for, for everything to go well with uh, all these individuals in your family with their pregnancies and uh, uh, all that stuff moving forward because it's all you could really ask for, right? As smooth of a pregnancy as possible and, and to have uh, healthy babies, right? Healthy, healthy children, man. That's all you can really ask for. So, uh, you, you guys will be in my thoughts. Cool. Um, nice pinky It's morphin time, dude. It's morphin time. Nice gamer. Um, so, I mean, we've talked about this a lot. Like we expected to see some care comparison stuff coming through and, and, uh, I feel like it's probably pretty close. Yeah, for sure, buddy. Yeah. Thanks again for the uh, raid. Thank you. Um, I don't know. I, I think uh, at this point, I, I still think it is pretty close. And I think a lot of it's uh, probably just going to be decided from person to person on, on more. Uh, if you're, if you gravitate more towards being an Xbox fan or a PlayStation fan at this point, I don't think either one is really standing out head and shoulders above the other, anything like that, you know? So I think that's where a lot of it's going to, you know, a determination for a lot of people is going to come in. One second. Sorry, I heard a thunk, man. I didn't know what it was. All right. Nice, Devea. Nice. Kippa. I don't think I've ever seen that emo. That's wild. Nice. Um, I think, again, what I was stating previously when we first started reading this article uh, about the comparisons between the two subscription services, I, I think really what, what's going to be the critical thing for, for both of them moving forward is what can they do to make themselves stand out uh, above the other, right? What what can they do to pull subscribers over from the other service to really make them look more unique, uh, offer something that the other is not giving uh, significantly? Uh, and that's going to be the play. That That's what they're going to be trying to do to each other moving forward. They're going to be playing this back and forth game here. Uh, clever... KBRD is a breakout where you bounce balls with your keyboard skills. It is Pong, dude. Oh, look at this noise. You see the, uh, can you guys see the kind of subtle keyboard, the QWERTY in here? Uh, I'm a big fan of breakout style games. You know, ones where you hit a little ball with a paddle and it breaks the blocks. I like those. They are good. One of the first games I ever remember playing was Super Breakout on the Game Boy. Uh, Inter developer Connor Atkin, a fairly new game designer graduate who had an oddly clever idea and made a prototype for us all to enjoy, KBRD. The basic idea is that you've got a little pixel ball, but instead of a paddle, you make a paddle using uh, any combination of two keys on your keyboard. So you might stretch between Q and P for a big wide paddle bounce or broadly redirect using something like P and Z or W and C for a perfect angle towards a block. New blocks pop up over time, as do little yellow bonus balls. While KBRD is still a prototype, it's available to play for free. It's by no means a complete game, truly just a, a prototype. But the appeal of the concept is clear. Any game that relies on the unique affordances 
of its input device will be at bare minimum interesting, at least for me. Twitter already abounds with ideas on how to improve, develop, and put unique spins on the concept. A cooldown on using letters rapidly, uh, forcing you to use every letter before using one again. Oh, and the like. Cooldown special items. You get the drift. Uh, you can find KBRD on itch.io, where you can play it in a browser. You can find more by developer Connor Atkin on itch.io and on Twitter. Yeah, that's really neat, man. That's really neat. Yeah, they, they can do some really cool stuff with this one. Really cool. I'll throw that in chat real quick. You guys take a look. I like keyboard games too. I think that's really cool. RDR actor addresses remake rumors. Uh, actor Rob Whitehoff, the uh, man responsible for bringing John Marston to life, has addressed the rumors of, of a remake of the 2010 game next to GTA. The Red Dead series is one of the most successful franchises Rockstar has under its belt. The beloved Western franchise takes the open world gameplay Rockstar is known for, meshes it with an incredibly deep emotional character-driven story. The franchise has been praised for its writing and storytelling as well as its incredible technical uh, advancements with its 2018 sequel. Uh, with the major gameplay and graphical leaps in Red Dead Redemption 2, many have been asking for a remake of the first game with those same features. For a time, Rockstar was reported, reportedly briefly considering planning a remake of Red Dead Redemption, something fans were eager for. Sadly, a recent report stated that the poor, for, poor performance of GTA Trilogy and the focus on GTA 6 means that RDR re Remake won't be happening anytime soon. Yeah, they, and they, they definitely came out and said that RDR Online is dead. Cash, what's up, man? I just name dropped you a second ago, man. What's going on? Yeah, RDR 1 was... Dude, I've got the cartridge in my room right now. Yeah, RDR 1 was amazing. <sighs> There was a Google thing where if you searched Atari Breakout on Google and went to images, it would create a playable version of Breakout Game. Are you for real? That's wild. I didn't know that. Right on. So being, was being the keyword, that's like no longer a thing, yeah? <laughs> Yo, Cash, what's up, buddy? Um, during an interview with YouTuber Dan Allen Gaming, John Marston actor Rob Whitehoff commented on the rumors of a RDR remake, noting that he'd love for it to happen, but has no idea if it will. Uh, I would love for it to happen. I don't know. I would love an opportunity to work with Rockstar again, whether it be remastering something or something totally different. I don't know. I can't really say enough good things about Rockstar. If they do that, great. That would be awesome. Um... Rockstar recently confirmed it won't be doing any more big updates for, for Red Dead Online. Not that they had gotten anything over the past like year and a half to two years anyways, because it was all updates, all the online stuff, content updates they had been doing. It was all just for uh, Grand Theft Auto V, man. Um, and it was, it basically turned into a giant meme at this point. Like, every time new updates came out for GTA V, it was like big content updates, right? And then uh, RDR Online would get like a pair of chaps or something. <laughs> you know, it's like there's like one new like uh, bounty and uh, like a new pair of like chaps you could go get or something. And everybody's like, "What is this crap?" You know, uh, it turned into this this giant thing. I mean, they hadn't been doing anything for Red Dead Online for a long time, uh, so it could uh, use those resources on GTA Six. As of right now, it remains unclear if Rockstar will be doing anything else with the RDR uh, franchise. Hard to imagine it wouldn't give the roaring success of the last game. Whether a remake of the first game is a possibility also remains unclear, but one uh, can hope. Again, I mean, people are also really, really, really... You know, people people have been wanting a remake of Bully for a long time, too. Only uh, Works only on older systems. Ah, gotcha, dude, gotcha. Oh, for real, Cash, yeah. I remember playing the crap out of it too, man. Yeah. 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 Uh, I don't know. I mean, we even recently, we saw, uh, there's a fan made, uh, somebody threw basically the bully trailer, you know, uh, like, uh, they, they put together, I don't know if it was the original bully, bully trailer or they just threw together like a new kind of bully trailer. But they did it all in, in uh, Unreal Engine 5, and it looked pretty amazing, man. For just like a fan-made kind of thing, it, it was pretty solid. And it gave a real good look, at, at, and I'm sure, man, there's like just people, you know, 
people have been wanting a bully remake forever as well from Rockstar, and that's just kind of been some sporadic rumor mill stuff for a long time. And uh, I'm sure that like this trailer we watched probably about a week ago in the news segment, it looked really good. Other than the it, the 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 voice, uh, the mouth movements for the voice acting was kind of nightmare fuel. It was it was a little bit rough, but again, it was just like a fan made thing. And other than that, everything looked really really good. And I'm sure it got a lot of people's uh, engine revving for Bully again. You know, uh, just to see what UE Five could do for a remake. Um, but again, Rockstar, man, they, they, they literally, they're not being very shy about the fact that their entire focus is just GTA. I mean, even, even with GTA five, it was at that point, not just with GTA six, even with GTA five, it was like, that's all they really cared about. Right. I mean, it's their, it's their cash cow. Right. So, uh, it's not real surprising, but it's. The thing that sucks is that there's there are other games they have that they've made that people love, and to see them just kind of totally just slough those off and um, not give those any love, whenever people want more content or remakes or whatever so badly, um, that feels bad, you know. PlayStation Survey asks players what types of NFTs they would buy. None? Is that an option? The survey came out of the Evo Fighting Game Tournament, which started on Friday and runs all the way through today, by the way. Um, special survey from PlayStation at Fighting Game Tournament Evo is asking players about the uh, type of NFT they are most interested in. Uh... Yep, Evo is taking place between August 5th and today, August 7th. And Twitter user Snorlax Owns shared a survey from PlayStation at the event as Sony bought Evo last year, saying uh, a special PlayStation Quest that Evo is asking players about what gaming NFTs they want to see from PlayStation. Again, I brought this up previously. One of the things that feels really bad about uh, Evo this year, because Sony did buy Evo last year, right? And what happened was Nintendo basically said, well, nobody can play Smash anymore at Evo. And across the board, uh, just as gamers, a, a lover of video games, and uh, it makes me feel for all those people that love the uh, competitive Smash scene and the fact that Nintendo is just being kind of petty and spiteful about the fact that Sony bought uh, the rights to Evo or bought the tournament, you know, and, and instead of just being like, okay, yeah, it's our competitor, but, uh, you know, ultimately we create video games for people to have fun. Smash has been part of this, uh, tournament for a very long time. They're like, no, nope. Smash is no longer going to be able to be played there, you know? And, and, uh, that feels really, really bad to me for the community of just people that love video games. So, um, that's something this article probably is not going to note, but this is the first time that Smash has not been played at Evo in a very, very, very long time, if ever. I don't know if Evo's ever been played without Smash until now. I can't remember. Uh, special PlayStation Quest at Evo. Yep, yep. IGN confirmed their presence of the survey at the event, which comes after the announcement of PlayStation Stars, a reward program that was promised definitely not, uh, be NFTs. Yeah. If you haven't heard about PlayStation Stars, this is like a new kind of incorporation to the PlayStation platform here where it's more like a play to earn kind of system, right? The more you play PlayStation games, the, the more kind of uh, generic currency you earn that you can spend to buy uh, like avatars or avatar borders or or uh things like that and i was immediately concerned whenever i saw this come up uh let's see if this is yeah this is actually if you want to read more about it this is uh, we've already read about it in the news segment so we know what playstation stars is if you're not familiar i'll throw this in chat so you can take a quick glance but 
It's a loyalty program. That was the first thing for me was like, dude, if this is uh, them bringing in like NFTs and stuff like that, this is terrible. And uh, that was immediately what they started getting hammered with. Sony started getting uh, hammered with, is this NFT stuff? Uh, what is this? You know, and and uh, immediately they were like, this is definitely not NFTs. We are not pushing this out. As and what my initial reaction was uh, is quite often you'll see this kind of thing. And my worry is that you'll see this kind of thing be brought up as a new incorporation, just like Sony has come up with this new Stars platform. Play to earn, um, which is fine, right? If you're going to be playing PlayStation games anyways, why not earn a little bit of generic currency that can't be used for any kind of real currency or whatever? I think that's the main thing to take out of it. Take, take that entire concept out um, that you can just use yourself to maybe build up your profile, uh, buy some backgrounds, just like on Steam or whatever. You know what I mean? Where you can kind of uh, flex your profile a little bit for people or whatever. You know what I mean? That That's fine. Okay. Um, but for them to come out and immediately go, no NFTs. Uh, my concern here is with companies going, they were rolling this out and whenever it blatantly looks like something that they want to be NFT style, blockchain style stuff, you know, it's really easy for them to say, no, it's not. And then turn it around on the back end after it releases and go, well, we didn't lie. It was never meant to be, but... Um, after taking a look at it and rolling it out, um, you know, it makes sense, uh, as a business decision for us to go ahead and incorporate NFTs into this. That is my concern, right? And, um, I can easily see them doing things like that and that's going to feel really bad. Yeah. Yeah. Pinky. Mm hmm. So, again, I mean, uh, you know, if you're just going to be playing games on their, their platform anyways and you're going to be grinding a little bit of generic currency by playing their games or getting a little bit of generic, like, points or whatever for getting achievements in games and you can use that to beef up your profile and, and do some, like, low-key, you know, profile flexing out there on, on the PlayStation platform or whatever, cool, man, you know, or, or whatever, but... When it starts being drawn into stuff like this, man, it's gonna get it's gonna get bad. Um, here you can see the survey right here. As part of the survey, PlayStation asked users, "What do you collect most?" Then provided a list with a follow-up question: Which of the following NFT digital collect uh, collectibles would you be most interested in purchasing? The list is as follows: Evo branded. Favorite music artists, favorite esports players and teams, PlayStation items, favorite game characters. Where's the none? Where's the none option? You know what I mean? The presence of the survey doesn't confirm or deny that PlayStation is in fact going into NFTs. Does seem to indicate the platform holder is considering it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a slippery slope though. You know what I mean? Um... Uh, it really is. Daniel Ahmad, an, an analyst at Nico Partners, then tweeted about how this isn't actually related to the war rewards program. This isn't related to PlayStation Stars. In this case, uh, digital collectibles is just a term that is used interchangeably with NFTs. <laughs> on the topic of NFTs, developers have alleged that GameStop has been selling indie, uh, NFTs without consent. We read about that yesterday. Someone on the company's marketplace has apparently been selling HTML5 games they did not make and don't have permission to sell. Yeah, I think around $15,000 worth of uh, revenue they made at this point. Yeah, uh, pretty wild. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's no surprise, right, that a lot of companies are looking at the prospect and uh, potential of incorporating 
crypto economy, blockchain, NFTs, Web3 uh, style mechanics and, and, and uh, development into their platforms and software, right? Uh, because it can be insanely lucrative, unfortunately. Um, quite often, it is an absolute scam as well. And uh, that's why I'm just like so solely against it right now. So, I don't know. That's just, uh, and again, it, th it's just another one of those things where it's like, it feels like for me, Sony is playing it kind of safe where they're rolling out some of this stuff and, and they're, de I mean, it's, it's undeniable now that they're, they're absolutely looking at incorporating these kinds of things into their own platform, um, and their software and stuff. And that's my, my big issue is whenever a company's, uh, rolling out this kind of stuff and people are going, okay, that could be a really cool concept. But are you incorporating NFTs? And they're going, no, 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 no. Because they don't want to deal with the upfront backlash uh, because there are so many people that are again against NFTs within the industry, right? Mm. They don't want to deal with the upfront backlash. So they'll just say, no, 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 no. And then when it comes out, there's going to be that potential for them to go, ah, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Let's just, yeah. It, even though you know it was always meant to be that way anyways, you know. That's what's going to feel bad. GTA Online player discovers secret outfit perks. GTA Online is one of the beefiest online video games out there due to the sheer content and possibilities, meaning sometimes players are still uncovering things. Uh, Rockstar Games is known for being incredibly detail-oriented, and that re remains true for GTA Online. The game is a massively online play uh, playground for players to live out all of their legal illegal fantasies, whether that be through a criminal empire or simply having the power to steal any vehicle you want and get away with it. Uh... The open-ended nature of GTA Online has kept players coming back for nearly a decade and ensures that Rockstar will keep updating it, despite killing off support for Red Dead Online in, f in favor of moving resources to GTA 6. Over on the GTA Online subreddit, user Ronnie Maloney put together a guide that tells players the hidden perks that some outfits in the game offer. If you go to the clothing store in the game and go up to the outfit section, you'll see a bunch of categorized pre-made outfits. If you put on something like one of the fairly expensive biker outfits, you will take less damage after crashing a bike. You'll supposedly have a 90% chance of surviving a fatal crash, and you'll only lose 5% of your health from any other kind of crash. We tested this one specifically and confirmed that it's true. Some commenters debated whether you actually need the full pilot suit to gain its perks, arguing that the helmet should be enough on its own. The rest of the list appears to be accurate. As of right now, it's unclear if any other outfit types provide any special perks. Some players noted that if you have the a rebreather equipped, it will skip the animation for eating a snack, though, it's, uh, though that's largely unnecessary now as there's a snack shortcut in the game. Okay, well, if you're a GTA 5-er, uh, check out the perks for the uh, clothes if you're not the outfits if you're not already up to date uh call of duty court case thrown out as a plaintiff never played the game court said uh the plaintiff could have easily verified these facts prior to filing the factually baseless complaint uh a court case has been dismissed after it was found that the plaintiff had hadn't played enough call of duty infinite warfare to back up claims made about the game Back in November 2021, Brooks Entertainment sued Activision Blizzard, the maker of Call of Duty franchise, in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of California for allegedly stealing the identity of Brooks Entertainment's founder, Sean Brooks, for 2016's Infinite Warfare. A document for court listeners says Brooks Entertainment owns the trademark for Sean Brooks and that it makes graphics and content for video games that are aimed at empowering youth, like, uh, like games Stock Picker and Save One Bank. Brooks Entertainment then says it was working with both Activision Blizzard and Rockstar Games to create a game between 2010 and 2015. Infinite Warfare then released in 2016 with Brooks claiming Activision Blizzard used Sean Brooks as its main character in Call of Duty and that this character uses the likeness, persona, and name of plaintiff's owner Sean Brooks and further infringes on plaintiff's trademark for Sean Brooks. Of the copyrighted material allegedly stolen by Activision Blizzard, Brooks Entertainment listed the following. Sean Sean Brooks has missiles at his disposal. Save One Bank is uniquely played in 
first person shooter and third person shooter and call of duty copied the same format and is played in first person shooter and third person shooter both games are played offshore the main characters of the games both bring uh thieves to just that, that is some very uh very vague uh comparison kind of stuff there yeah i mean you know how many other games you could like uh bring into the mix that are this same exact kind of <laughs> Uh, those that have played Infinite Warfare will know that Sean Brooks isn't the protagonist of the game. Nick Reyes is. And that the game didn't, in fact, copy the third-person shooter format as the game is exclusively first-person. Then in January of this year, Activision Blizzard's counsel told Brooks Entertainment Council that the complaint contained serious factual mis misrepresentations and errors and that the claims set forth therein are both factual, factually and legally frivolous adding that it would file for Rule 11 sanctions, requesting Brooks pay a fine for submitting uh, unsubstantiated arguments. <laughs> Activision Blizzard called the claims delusional, claim, called the claims delusion, with the court recording one of the... Uh, Publer's arguments as well. Sean Brooks is a common name, and Activision's character is Sean, not Sean, like plaintiff. Uh, Activision Sean is an armored Irish space marine, while the plaintiff Sean is an African-American San Diego-based uh, financial consultant and cigar salesman. The court then said in its ruling that Brooks Entertainment Council could have easily verified these facts prior to filing the factually baseless complaint, just as the court easily verified them within the first hour and a half of playing the game. Brooks Entertainment cannot refile the claim in the same court, which ordered it to pay Activision Blizzard for the time and money wasted. This was written on July 12th of this year. The court basically finds the whole argument crazy, said Richard Hoig, a lawyer in contact with Kotaku. Brooks Entertainment even included Rockstar Games for no reason, which didn't help their cause uh, with the judge. So the sanctions here are Brooks Entertainment has to pay for Activision's legal fees and costs. Okay. That was weird. All right, here we go. Madden 23 devs want to stop money plays forever. Uh, the developers working on Madden 23 have a very simple plan for the game, and it starts with the focus on the game's so-called money plays. The idea behind the Madden NFL franchise is meant to be simple. It's supposed to be simu simulating uh, playing a real football, a real game of football. Trouble is that unless the game is immaculate, it will feel more like playing an exploitable video game. For those who uh, committedly play Madden, it's not just about running cool, good plays or identifying holes in opponents' formations. Much more important are things like exploiting the game's AI and the, and the physics engine. The results in dedicated players finding particular plays that have a higher probability of winning, dubbed money plays. Uh, while they've existed for years, the Madden NFL 23 creators are looking to kill off money plays forever and devs have, have admitted as much. Uh, they'd rather focus on just making sure people spend as much real money playing the game as possible. Because that's what EA does, right? Uh, money plays in the Madden series are offensive plays uh, that have a high probability of success because AI defensive players struggle to deal with them. These are the plays that almost guarantee yardage unless opponents know exactly how to defend against them and have the proper lineup in place to do so. Mm. I think from a high level, just the changes we did in deep zone and pass rush this year helps combat the problem of money plays. We added zone drift logic that gives our deep zoners the awareness to not continue drifting up the field if they don't have a vertical threat so they can leverage that deep crossing route. An EA Sports senior producer has told IGN. While there's no perfect defensive scheme in real life football, the issue is amplified in the Madden video game. The size and commitment of the video game uh, of the Madden player base inevitably leads to players finding the little tricks required to bait simulated defenders out of position in ways that reliably result in forward progress. Stopping money plays through in-game improvements to defense, including the new mechanics in the field sense system, was one of the top priorities for the team in Madden 23. This will ultimately go down as something of a rebuilding year for the Madden franchise, but that may be welcome news for series fans. Though it remains one of the most popular gaming franchises in the world, the game has struggled with its quality control over the last few years. Madden 21 fizzled with critics and cratered with fans with a 6.3 media review average and a .5 fan average according to Metacritic. 
Madden 22 was a modest improvement, but still checks in with one of the worst review averages in the series' history. There are some new bells and whistles coming to Madden 23, including the improvements to the game's franchise mode. The goal for the Madden development team still seems to be to give fans what they're accustomed to, but to do it better than before. And that may be just what the series needs at this point. Uh, I mean, I'm glad they're trying to address these uh, kind of more exploitive types of plays in the game and stuff. But ultimately, look, we've talked about this with EA Games uh, even recently, right? EA Games, <laughs> sports games especially, year to year they pump these things out. They do not have a, a real serious concern for addressing improvement of the game year to year. What they have a sole focus on is their uh, their cash gains, right? You pay 60, 70 bucks for the game, and then they uh, their, their, their big thing for the game is the uh, Ultimate Team stuff, whether it be FIFA Ultimate Team or Hockey Ultimate Team or Madden Ultimate Team, uh, whatever, dude. All these sports games they come out with, it's about loot boxing, getting people to pay more and more money, and... Uh, they don't really have a dedicated view at, at improving the gameplay year to year. It's it's that's not what I mean, those games have been like that forever. I mean, it's literally why I quit playing NHL a long time ago. I loved NHL. That was my game, man. That was my game for years. I'm talking like four to five years in a row. And then it got to a point where I noticed that EA just they weren't doing anything. It was like playing the same game every year, but it was getting worse. It felt like. And I was like, I'm done. I can't do this. Uh, and it, they were taking away from the other kind of game modes. They, they It felt like they were really stripping the other game modes out of the game. And m trying to make people focus on the ultimate team stuff. Which is where you have to pay additional money to build up your team. Buy packs of players and stuff like that. And I was like, this is just, I'm done. It, you know, it felt bad. But that's EA, man. That's what they do. That's why we need competition, right? That's why we need competition. And that's why it's good to see, like, multiple wrestling games coming into the uh, the play now. Um, with AEW and WWE both going to have a uh, professional wrestling game in the, in the you know, the gaming world now. And, and we've got uh, FIFA and EA are, are breaking apart. They're no longer going to be collaborating, right? So EA is going to continue making their... Uh, it's going to be called EA Sports FC moving forward. And FIFA is collaborating with other developers to make their FIFA game moving forward. Uh, competition is good. And we need more of it. EA has had a lock on these sports games for way too long, man. Where we need other good developers making uh, quality versions of these sports games. Uh, get EA out of the mix as far as I'm concerned. Sony buying Square Enix would be the best thing for the uh, both of them. Uh, some of the stuff I'm hearing about Sony doesn't make me feel too good either, but a lot of the stuff I'm hearing about Square Enix makes me really, really scared. Uh, Like many people, I've been watching the news about Warner Brothers uh, this week in disbelief. Their decision can be almost a complete Batgirl. Remove films from their streaming service, completely change their approach to DC Comics, has been heavily criticized by everyone, and resulted in their stock price tanking. I don't know what's going to happen to them eventually, but it all seems such an unnecessary, self-inflicted wound that it couldn't be helped but remind me of video games. Specifically, it reminded me of Square Enix, whose bizarre decision to sell almost their entire Western business... Uh, for what an, on a corporate scale is pocket change seems not only crazy but completely inexplicable. They had to offer some kind of explanation to investors though and came up with the idea that it was because they were worried about the games cannibalizing each other's sales. Yeah. Uh, which is so nonsensical I can only assume it was a translation error. Or the worst excuse since the classic tale of your dog eating your homework. Yeah, really weird. Digging through the rumors and theories, you come to the much more reasonable explanation that the two developers were overly expensive to run and that the management didn't get on with Square Enix HQ in Japan. Combine that with so-so sales for the last few games and it begins to make some sort of sense. 
why they didn't just get rid of whatever managers were causing a problem and maybe form new teams with the same developers, I don't know. In the end, they virtually gave them away, and I'm sure there must have been something more constructive they could have done. I guess they just got fed up with all of it, though, and wanted out. There's also the suggestion that they wanted to sell off their unprofitable studios in order to make themselves more desirable as Sony. Yeah, I mean, I talked about that as well. Of the studios, uh, major studios out there that had been rumored to sell still this year after, you know, what we'd seen happen with Activision Blizzard uh, in the process of being acquired by Microsoft and Bungie uh, being acquired by Sony, the uh, studios that were really being rumor milled out there to still uh, have the potential to be acquired were EA, Ubisoft, and Square Enix. And we'd seen Ubisoft do stuff to kind of clean up shop. And uh, that's kind of what it looked like Square Enix might be doing as well, right? Um, that made sense to a degree, but surely Sony would not would have been interested in Tomb Raider. Absolutely. Not least because they have a film division. Yeah, and Laura Croft used to ba uh, basically be their mascot. But no. If Sony were interested in buying Tomb Raider, I'm sure they'd, they'd have outbid the $300 million it went for. Yeah, I mean... Look, again, $300 million is not chump change, man, right? $300 million is a lot. But in the grand scheme of things, for what Square Enix sold, there was like four North American development studios, the Deus Ex, Tomb Raider, and Thief franchises all to Embracer Group for $300 million? It's like... Basically, po yeah, it's like pocket change, man. In the, in the 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 grand scheme of things, they could have even sold off the developers and everything else afterwards to recoup most of the money, but they didn't. Uh, so they must want Square Enix just for their role playing games. Uh, it is a significant thing as a way to fill in for the fact that they shut down their own Japanese studios and now are a Japanese company that doesn't make any games in its home country. Except they haven't bought Square Enix. We saw with Microsoft and Activision Blizzard that these deals can be done very quickly, and presumably, Square Enix and Sony have been talking a long while about this. It hasn't happened, though, which may mean Sony backed out or the whole thing was never going to happen anyway. Personally, though, and despite all the nonsense of the last few months, I hope it happens. Sony desperately needs an anchor in Japan, and there's none bigger than Square Enix, whatever you think of their games. Square Enix also needs some sensible leadership. Yes. As for years, they've seemed rudderless, and if it wasn't for them having enough hits to get by... Uh, dude, I've been talking about this for a while now. Square Enix has seemed like they have just been leaning on their titles. Leaning on their um, notable titles. Like so many large devs get to... Uh, uh, unfortunately, they get to a point where... Um, they're kind of stuck. They don't know what to do anymore besides just hop on the shoulders of like Final Fantasy and um, you know just ride it out just ride it out it's you know they, they've lost who they were uh, when we fell in love with these development studios and, and instead they just and I mean with Square Enix the thing that's really concerning me is like they are all in on the uh, the pivot into it's all NFTs it's all blockchain that's another thing they they blamed you know, they were like, we, we're going to sell these North American development studios and these IPs that we, we don't feel like we need anymore because we want capital. We want this $300 million that we're selling this to Embracer Group for uh, to invest in this uh, venture moving forward for Web3 and, and blockchain NFTs. And, and uh, that's where we're going. That's where we're going. And for somebody that grew up playing Square Enix and loving Square Enix games, and, uh, you know, uh, hearing them say that is just like, you know, it's kind of crushing my gamer soul, you know. Uh, becoming more focused with technical backup from Sony would be great for them, and it would also keep Microsoft's hands off them. Some may not see this as a positive, but I'm very dubious about Microsoft's ability to, to manage the studios it already owns, let alone a massive one in Japan with which it has absolutely nothing in common. In an ideal world, all companies would be separate, but if Square Enix has to be owned by someone, I hope it's Sony. I just have no idea if it'll actually happen. Uh, yeah, I don't know, man.
I think that's the thing that's really hard, right? The thing that's really hard is we've gotten to this point where even whenever it, it came to the news, the day the news came out, and you guys have heard me say this time and time, the day the news came out about uh, Microsoft agreeing to acquire Activision Blizzard, my initial reaction to that was, this is bad for competition, but I am glad Microsoft is buying that company because I think that if if anybody can buy that company and strip it down and turn it back into something decent, it's probably Microsoft. And I think that's where we've gotten with so many of these these like developers that we used to love and and they used to be good and they've turned into like this just mess of crap. Um where they don't look like they know what they're doing and they they, you know, they just lean on these particular IPs that they've they've uh got these huge fan bases around, you know. Um It's like they don't know how to do anything hardly anymore. Uh, But just lean on that stuff. And I think that's where, I mean, I I see this the same way as it it seems like this. The person that wrote this article, the author of this seems, they're seeing it in the same light as me. Is like, it almost seems like the, the only way around riding the ship, as it were, for some of these developers that we've loved for so long is, for a better studio to come in and buy them and hopefully be able to turn it around, which sucks for competition at the same time, you know? And, and I don't know what the, the solution is other than that, but I don't know. It, it, it feels bad. It does. It feels bad. Marvel versus Capcom 2 freed at last. Evo is back. The titular fighting game tournament returns this week under the banner of Sony. Here, skillful players of all levels join together to fight it out. Evo is uh, also home to showcase and major announcements for the fighting game community. Arcade One Up brings surprising news about Marvel vs. Capcom 2. Uh, back to basics. Arcade One Up deals in the arcade business. Specifically, they bring classic video games to your home and arcade cabinets. These cabinets are high quality and affordable units. Previously, Arcade 1-Up created a Marvel vs. Capcom cabinet. Oh, dude. I'm in love. Look at this. Turtles. X-Men vs. Street Fighter. Miss Pac-Man. Mr. Pac-Man. Galaga. That's Centipede. MK2. Dude, what a room. What a room. That's great. That's great. Uh, Or is that Galaga? That's not... Yeah, yeah. Galaga and Centipede. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Looks like. Why is this surprising? Many have argued uh, Marvel vs. Capcom 2 is the most beloved title in the series. If true, porting it to PC or future generation consoles should be a simple decision. However, the licenses surrounding the Marvel characters have held it back. Yeah, Thus, the title remained off the market from purchase, uh, including online sales. Fans started cam- campaigns like hashtag free MVC2 to help the beloved title regain its time in the sun. Now, Arcade 1 Up hopes to deliver. The new arcade cabinet will bring the title to fans' homes once again. This cabinet includes Marvel vs. Capcom 2, along with all the titles from the Marvel vs. Capcom cabinet. Likewise, it is capable of local and online play with other cabinets. Dude, that is sick. That is sick. Online play with other cabinets, dude. This is a huge boon. There are many in the fighting game community who have stayed with Marvel vs. Capcom 2. Now interest may rise once again. It is unclear the way uh, Arcade 1 Up circumvented the licensing. However, one can assume it is due to the language used in the legal documents. Arcade cabinets fall under toys, despite being a medium for video games. Therefore, the title can safely be brought back through correct legal measures. Obviously, it is more complicated than that, as the community has gone this long without Marvel vs. Capcom 2. Yet the future is hopeful. 
Evo may even feature the hit title moving forward. The road to console and PC ports will still be a long one. That's sick. Yo, that's awesome. That's great. That's just great for the gaming world, man. That's a win right there, guys. That's a win. There we go. Uh, Deus Ex developer may not release new entry for a very, very long time. Deus Ex developer Eidos Montreal, uh, who is being acquired from Square Enix by uh, Embracer Group, may not be prioritizing a new Deus Ex game right now. Over the last decade or so, Eidos Montreal has experienced a lot of adjustments behind the scenes. Although both of the developers' last two Deus Ex games were received extremely well by critics and fans, they failed to make the commercial splash that Square Enix wanted them to even after including things like microtransactions in the last entry. The developer went uh, on to help out on Shadow of the Tomb Raider and develop Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, which also underwhelmed Square Enix sales-wise, but was a pretty well-received game, pretty well-rated game, right? Eidos Montreal has previously stated that Deus Ex IP isn't dead, but it's unclear when it will return. Earlier this week, it was reported that Eidos Montreal wants to make a new Deus Ex game that could... Do what Cyberpunk 2077 didn't. We read about that. Uh, it's certainly an ambitious aspiration as one that would likely be widely embraced, but it was also suggested that the game is still years away from happening, even if it's being worked on in any significant capacity. While Eidos' aspirations may still be true, journalist Jason Schreier took to Reset Era to state the game furthest along in development at Eidos Montreal is a new IP and that a Deus, uh, new Deus Ex game would still be years away, if there are plans to make one. Schreier didn't explicitly say that Eidos isn't working on a new Deus Ex, but it's likely it's in a very early development and likely has only a small team working on it if it's a real thing. Uh, given Eidos Montreal just released its most recent game last fall, likely to be a while before we see this next game either. No details were given with regards to the new IP. Does also likely rule out that we're getting a Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy sequel anytime soon too. Okay, well, that just kind of uh, is... A bit more news regarding what we had already read about what they do want the new Deus Ex to be, which was like what people thought Cyberpunk should have been, I guess. This is a weird title. We'll read this real quick. Uh, Skull Girls confirms playable characters of the next years. Uh, Skull Girls are getting Mary in their playable character roster. Skull Girls has been on the gaming market for 10 years. Fans of the franchise demanded long enough for devs to turn Mary into a playable character. The developer Hidden Variable Studios is making uh, that dream come true. After 10 years of fighting and turmoil, the Skull Heart was destroyed, writes uh, TVs on social media. Okay. Uh, Mary will join Skull Girls 2 Encore in 2023 and Skull Girls Mobile. Uh, Skull Girls fans like Mary both as stories and for a game. This is a, a very uh, weirdly written. Uh, I don't. This is probably not this this author's initial uh, uh, first language English. I'm guessing. Uh, a dev has to make Black Dahlia, Umbrella, and Mary playable to tell the full stories of the games. Interestingly, all three characters will be included in the year pass. Uh, They played a teaser during EVO 2022. Confirms they are officially adding Mary to the playable character roster of school, Skull Girls. Unfortunately, the video didn't expose any scenes of Mary in action. The second of, uh, of the trailer merely said that Mary would come soon. The character was portrayed by her friend Peacock. Many of the game's fans recognize this character as Patricia. Okay. There you go. So if you are a fan of Skull Girls, there's a little bit of... Uh, what's to come there for character playable characters moving forward, okay? This is the last thing I have for today. If you have any news uh, prevalent for video game industry, video gaming world, bring it to me in chat. We'll discuss it before we move on to our gaming for today, which will probably consist of some Gwent and some Fall Guys, stuff like that, okay? Uh, Octopath Traveler, uh, and shout out to... Uh, our buddy Gamer Extreme, he was uh, bringing uh, this topic to light to me early in, uh, in earlier in the the uh, the segment this morning. Um, I wasn't aware that there was an Octopath Traveler uh, kind of spinoff for mobile, 
And um, we're just going to take a quick peek here and see what Kotaku has to say about this title. Uh, Octopath Traveler Champions of the Continent is better than the Nintendo Switch original, Kotaku says. The mobile prequel to Square Enix's uh, Switch RPG has a great combat system and incredibly likable characters. Uh, this was uh, written on the 29th of July, so uh, just a little over a week ago, a week and a half ago. Octopath Traveler Champions of the Continent, newly available on mobile, is a worthy sequel to the original 2018 Switch role-playing game. I had expected a watered-down combat system and a menu uh, hell like many other gotcha games on mobile devices. Uh, Square Enix proved me wrong. Champions retains the visuals and music that made Octopath a unique title in a field of pretty RPGs, and its streamlined combat is a massive improvement over the grindiness of the original game. Octopath is even better on mobile than it ever was on the Switch. In 2018, Square Enix released the original Octopath Traveler on the Switch, set in the same continent of Austera. Champions is a prequel, taking uh, place some unspecified period of time before Octopath. While the protagonists of Octopath do appear in some side quests, the narrative is centered around a band of merry adventurers who are united by the Holy Ring carried by the first Chosen, your first player character who is randomized th through the gotcha. It's an interesting take on the first game's narrative system where eight characters happen to join up together for reasons that were even more tenuous. While there are side quests centered around each of the characters, the main campaign focuses on three themes, wealth, fame, and power. Each main quest line revolves around toppling a tyrant who exemplifies one of the main qualities. One of those qualities, excuse me. The adventurer group can also accumulate points in each of those qualities, which affect NPC recruitment and resource gathering. Critics generally praise the first Octopath game's art style, combat, and music, but some found the progression to be grindy and the story to be uninteresting. So I was a little nervous when I found out that Champions was a mobile game. Many players who are used to premium console titles often find the mobile grind too frustrating to endure. After years of playing games on mobile, I have an enormous amount of patience, but even I remember feeling that Octopath Traveler was a bloated time sink. I was prepared for Champions to exacerbate the original problem. I was also concerned about how well the Octopath art style would adapt to a mobile game. The character designs are whimsical and effectively tap into the nostalgia many players feel for the 16-bit JRPGs of the 90s, but they aren't exactly uh, horny or eye-catching. With the exception of dancers, the characters wear uh, pragmatic clothes in earthy colors. I couldn't see myself obsessing over fan art of Octopath characters the way that I did with uh, was it Sanus or Canis in Fate Grand Order or the Dragon Girl uh, Shane. In Ark Knights. By the time I started Champions, I, I barely remembered what the Octopath Traveler characters looked like. Uh, these were the concerns I had before actually playing the game. Eight hours later, those concerns are largely forgotten. I realized that Champions is my absolute favorite way to play Octopath Traveler. The auto travel function, where you flick the screen to uh, auto run across the landscape, feels intuitive. Uh, there are buttons to stack every character's moves at once, which makes ordinary battles go by a lot faster. If I only encountered a couple of weak enemies, I could finish the battle with two taps. Champions also introduces the concept of reserve party members in the back who can be swapped in and out at will. If someone got hit by a status effect, I simply stuck them in the back line. Use the reserve party members benched. Characters also recover both health and uh, mana. Since up to eight characters are present in every battle, easier to spread experience points around uh, to more characters. In both games, combat mostly revolves around targeting enemy weaknesses in order to break their shields. Uh, doing so was tricky in the original game. Multiple enemies in the same battle often had different weaknesses, such as pull arms, daggers, or fire. And boss battles became uh, excruciating when bosses would change their weaknesses. In Champions, however, with my party divided into two rows, I could arrange my front line to break enemy shields with multi-hit basic attacks on the first turn, then use my back line of powerful characters to pummel the enemy's health on the next turn. I marveled at how Champions managed to make Octopath feel less grindy by making small tweaks. It didn't have to be an overhaul, and the combat still works similar, similarly to how it does in the Switch original. The impact of status effects is now greatly diminished. A savvy decision that lets champions do away with inventory management entirely could obtain equipable weapons and items, but I no longer had to juggle recovery or status ailment uh, items. Didn't have to think about the difference between Herb of Clarity and Herb of Awakening, which was a truly uh, crappy experience when I finished Octopath last year. NPC summons system had also been simplified considerably. No longer are summons tied to specific characters. You can now temporarily recruit people by fighting or paying them. 
regardless of who's in your party. These might be sad changes for RPG fans who enjoy managing their inventories or enduring the consequences of status conditions, but they gave me a more enjoyable RPG experience. Shush. I uh, love every single person I recruited through the gotcha system. The return of Octopath's character focused quest system allowed me to grow attached with the characters at my own pace. Uh, while some RPG fans might feel that Octopath's characters aren't morally gray or complex enough, I adore how humble, relatable, and genuinely likable the characters are. Used to recruiting uh, highborn nobles, legendary warriors, or even gods in other gotcha games, even though the cast consists of up to 80 playable characters, the writing makes, makes each of them distinctive and likable in a down to earth way. Rather than er everything being incredibly high stakes and intense, I spent a lot of time simply helping people feed their kids or figure out their research project. The more streamlined Champions experience allowed me to return to my game whenever I felt like it. I didn't have to relearn a complicated system in order to progress. Strikes the perfect balance between uh, approachable enough to those who have never played Octopath Traveler and faithful enough for those who want Champions to be a direct follow-up. Uh... While mobile, mobile gotcha games often have a bad reputation for being a cash grab, it's clear that the developers of Champions put very careful thought into designing a turn-based RPG that feels good to play, and many uh, of the new combat and quest system redesigns are intended to improve the single-player experience rather than the monetization aspect. The new features, the way that the themes intersect with gameplay systems and the relatable characters make Champions a vastly improved single-player experience compared to its predecessor. Cool. Cool. Uh, this looks like a screenshot, does it not? Sorry, I mean, I, I skipped through stuff because I, I'm going through the text, right? Um, is this not a screenshot of uh, the mobile? I think that is right. Oh no, you're good, dude. You're good. Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, uh, quite often, um, you know, whenever I'm I'm blazing through the the text, I'm I'm reading things. I'll go back and watch like trailers and stuff. But uh, you know, if you guys need me to take a take a beat and uh, look at the uh... oh yo Samara, cool. Yeah, yeah, right on, right on. Yeah, congrats, congrats. Uh, yeah, all good. Uh, I mean, you guys know, you know, don't don't ever hesitate to let me know if you need me to take a beat, address uh, something a little further, take a take a look at at uh, some pics or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah, it sounds decent. It sounds decent, man. Uh, thanks, thanks, gamer. Yep. I mean, as far as uh, mobile titles go, it sounds like it could be a cool experience. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. That's what I've got, guys. That's what I've got for the, the news segment today. Um, it didn't look like we had anything else that, that got brought up. So uh, I'll say thank you to everybody that was part of this news segment. And uh, thank you to everybody that's always part of this community. You guys rock. Um, we'll be moving on to some gameplay today. I don't know, a little bit of Gwent. I feel like playing some Gwent this morning. So we'll do some Gwent and see what else we get into today. Um, and... I don't know if you're checking this out later as a VOD on YouTube and uh, you're enjoying what uh, the new segment is offering you, then see what you can do about maybe coming in and hanging out with me and the rest of our amazing community here when we go live every single day on Twitch. Uh, the link is down below uh, for the channel. We go live at 6 a.m. CST every single day uh, where we start all of our streams off with the video gaming news, okay? Uh, and if you're enjoying the content, also consider please hitting that like and subscribe button and maybe leave me a comment so we can have some discussion between myself and other community members regarding some of these topics that we went over today. Okay. Other than that, you guys just stay healthy, stay safe, be kind to one another, and we will see everybody tomorrow for August 8th edition of Video Gaming News. All right.